Santos. Um, so with that, uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event tonight uh, entitled Immigration and the New Class War with our distinguished guest, Michael Lind. Our event tonight is part of a larger spring series at the college on the theme, Who is My Neighbor, Immigration, Freedom, uh, and Community. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm professor of religion and philosophy at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the Institute's freedom for freedom, uh, Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring uh, tonight's event. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and encourage free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public by exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society. The Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easier, comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. <coughs> For help in organizing our event tonight, very special thanks, as always, go to the staff of the Institute, Administrative Assistant Shannon Regeer and Assistant Director Greg Seams. Uh, none of what you see tonight happens without their energy and diligence. Thanks also to Molly Work and Carl Carrie Vanderveen of Marketing and Communications and to Jeff O'Donnell, Joshua Wyatt, and the uh, Broadcast Media Services crew for their contributions. Thanks to students who are helping us tonight, Ava Bowman, Ezra Garcia, Gervon Nagumba, and Vilma Rivera for helping us this evening. Finally, uh, thanks to Mike Feuerstein, Professor of the Public Affairs Conversation and students in the Public Affairs Conversation course who are here uh, with us tonight. We're pleased to be in conversation tonight with Michael Lind. Michael is currently visiting professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin. He received his BA and his JD from the University of Texas at Austin and an MA in International Relations from Yale University. He's a co-founder of New America, a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C., and has been an editor or staff writer for The New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, and The National Interest. Michael is the author of a number of important books on American political and economic history and policy, among them Made in Texas, George W. Bush and the Southern Takeover of American Politics, published in 2003. The American Way of Strategy, U.S. Foreign Policy and the American Way of Life, published in 2006. Land of Promise, an Economic History of the United States, published in 2012. Most recently, Michael co-authored with Robert D. Atkinson, Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business, published in 2018. These books and others Michael has authored have been hailed by reviewers as major contributions to American policy discussions, and the book's contents mark Michael Lind as a remarkably capacious, indeed in moments encyclopedic intellect, an erudite historian and acute analyst, analyst of a wide range of economic, social, and strategic problems that the United States has faced throughout its history and in, in our own time. Generally, Michael characterizes himself as, and he, these are his words in an email to me, a small d democratic nationalist in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton, Theodore, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In domestic policy, still his own words, this means support for a mixed economy with protections for workers, not a free market, in foreign policy, it means a realist approach to achieving a peaceful and prosperous world based on great power existence. It means strategic trade in the service of the national industrial base and immigration in the national interest. Immigration in the national interest. This is actually Michael's second visit to St. Olaf. He was with us as a guest of the Institute in fall 2016 just before the election of Donald Trump to the presidency to talk about the presidential election. I think it's fair to say this is about a month before the election that all of us were surprised as to what happened there. Uh, we're glad to have him with us again. Would you join me in welcoming Michael Lind this time for a conversation about immigration and the new class war. 
Well, thanks, Ed. I'd like to thank Professor Santuri and the uh, Institute for Freedom and Community. Uh, I do regret the introduction because you're supposed to lower expectations. Uh, so I don't disappoint people, but you may have built them up a little bit, but, but I, I hope you won't. But it is a, it's great to be back. Uh, Northfield, Minnesota, yay. So uh, 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 had a very uh, wonderful, engaging audience. Uh, and I say this as the veteran of many, many audiences in many places. Uh, so that's always a pleasure when, when you have uh, students and, and community members and uh, uh, other academics uh, like the ones here. Yeah. Uh, so let's start. Michael, in, in summer 2017, you published an article in the journal American Affairs, an article entitled The New Class War. And among other things, you proposed in that essay that American immigration policy should be assessed against the background of this new class war. Now this new class war wasn't the class war that precisely that Marx talked about, that is to say a war between the owners of the means of production, the capitalists, and the working class. This was a class war, you said, which was a war between a new class, a managerial class, a transnational managerial class, and the working class. What do you mean precisely by class war, this new class war, and what are the implications for the immigration question? Well, class analysis is rare in ordinary politics because all factions, left, right, and center, want to claim there's no class division, there's good people and bad people, right? Or there's the public interest and the correct conception and the mistaken conceptions. Uh, I find it uh, uh, indispensable in understanding American society and, and societies anywhere in the world. Uh, I should say that class analysis, as Marx himself wrote, he said, I, I, I was not original with me, said Marx. You know, this goes back to Aristotle and Plato and theories of different classes. Uh, the, the body of thinking that I'm building on in this uh, American Affairs essay, and also in a book based on it, called The New Class War, which will be published in, by Penguin in the fall, uh, goes back to the middle of the 20th century when uh, James Burnham, who had been the number two deputy of uh, Trotsky, in the United States, the dissident uh, Soviet communist, broke with the, the communists and the Trotskyites and uh, wrote a book called The Managerial Revolution uh, in 1942 when he said Marx was right about industrialization creating this new class structure. He was wrong about what, where history is going. He said, and he was still, it was very Marxist analysis still, he said, uh, uh, in pre-modern agrarian society, the two big classes were the landlords and the peasants, or the farm workers. They could be slaves, they could be serfs, they could be free, you know, peasants. Industrialism converted most of the peasants into wage earners, the proletarians. Proletariat comes from a Latin word which means somebody without property. You would die if you were not paid wages, right? You're totally dependent on a labor market. Having a majority of wage workers, you only get that in, in industrial societies, the so 19th and 20th centuries. And then the capitalists who had been merchants or shop, you know, smiths, in some cases they were artisans, very low status in medieval society, become the richest people in first Britain and then in the United States, in Germany, France. Uh, so Marx predicted that the bourgeoisie the classic capitalist who is the owner operator of a business and is running it. Think of Ebenezer Scrooge, right? You're, you're running the business and, and Bob Cratchit is working for you. Uh, eventually, the proletariat, Bob Cratchit is going to replace Ebenezer Scrooge peacefully or violently and then the workers will run everything themselves. Uh, so, well this was, that had not worked out in the time since the publication of the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Now it's almost a century later and Burnham said, no, what we see happening, and he drew on uh, Gardner and Means, two American scholars, uh, uh, their work on, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the rise of the manager. 
you got these enormous corporations like U.S. Steel, the first billion dollar company. Andrew Carnegie technically was the capitalist owner, uh, but he couldn't m monitor what all of these hundreds of, or thousands of workers were doing. So you created this new class of managers who uh, you created business schools, right? You created the MBA, right? Uh, you had lawyers, you had marketers, you had all of these managers and professionals running these gigantic corporations in, in Europe and the US. Uh, and Burnham said in the 1940s that their equivalents in other industrial countries are the bureaucrats in the Soviet Union, right? Uh, so, uh, and technically, the, the working class ran the Soviet Union. He said, no, 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 there's a new ruling class. It consists of the managers, and they're members of the Communist Party. It's what was later called the nomenclature. It's about you know, a few percent of the population, but they're the same as the bosses in the United States. He argued that in the so-called capitalist societies, the passive investors depended on the managers, on the CEOs, who did not own the corporations. Right? They might own some stock, but they, they were essentially employees of, of General Electric or U.S. Steel or whatever. And in practice, they were the ones making the decisions, not the, the stock owners necessarily. So he predicted, a rather pessimistic book. He said that in different forms in the U.S., in, Europe, in, in the fascist countries, he, he wrote this during World War II when fascism was still an option, in the communist countries, which have been around since the Russian Revolution, you're gonna get this managerial class come to power. And then the trick is to restrain it. And that's the, the challenge of democracy in all ruling classes. That is, how does the majority, whether they're peasants in the old days, or uh, in workers, wage earners in the, in the present, how do they check the power of, of this elite that, that uh, is really running things. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, great liberal economist, uh, was influenced by Burnham and, and that shaped his idea of what he called the technostructure in his book, The New uh, Industrial State in the 1960s, where he made a similar argument. Uh, and so this, it's not entirely original with me. I used the term in my first book, The Next American Nation, overclass. Uh, and there was a Newsweek cover story uh, which kind of got it wrong because what I mean by overclass is simply managerial professional class. It's, it's people with college degrees, but particularly with advanced degrees, who are about 10, 15% of the population. I belong to it. Many of you in the room, if not most of you, if you have college educated, college students and so on, uh, it's us, right? It's not this 0.001% of billionaires out there Arguably, we run the country uh, in the sense that you, you, uh, things that go against our interests as college-educated professionals get nowhere politically. And, and I'll just give you two examples of that. Uh, in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton and I think some of the other Democratic candidates say we need to raise taxes on, on the rich. Uh, and, but we need to cut taxes on the middle class. And if memory serves, uh, Hillary def defined the middle class as $200,000 a year or below. I'm sorry, if, if your household is $200,000, you're, you're way up there. You're like 97th, 98th percentile. But, but this professional class is so powerful, you would see uh, letters now and then to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times saying, you know, I'm a dentist, I make $400,000 a year, and my wife is a lawyer, we pull down 800 grand. We can hardly pay our bills, <laughs> right? We're middle class. Who are these people calling us rich? How can you live in New York City on less than a million dollars a year, right? So, so one of my purposes in the article as well as in the books kind of shock people into thinking uh, it's not the 1% or even the 0.01%. It's the top 10 or 15%. Uh, and my interpretation of the populism that we're seeing on both sides of the Atlantic in the United States that produced Trump and that produced Brexit in Britain and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the yellow jacket protesters in uh, France, uh, this clearly got class dimensions to it. That is, on one side, you tend to have the college-educated professionals who cluster in Europe and America in a fairly small number of, of big cities. Uh, hubs, I call them in the book. 
And then you've got uh, the working classes of all races, uh, and, and particularly in the United States, uh, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, as of, of uh, the first decade of the 20, 20th, first century, are majority suburban now. So the whole idea of urban minority, that, that, that was true in the 60s and 70s. It's not true now. So you're seeing this uh, geographic division and you see this when you look at electoral maps, if you do it at the county level, right? So the red and the blue uh, in the United States, the red being Republicans, the blue being uh, Democrats, the blue is big cities and college towns. The red is kind of everywhere else. It's not really the countryside because most of, of the people who vote red kind of live in the outer suburbs of these big metro areas. Uh, so geographically, this is the expression of, of the class division between the uh, college educated professionals who tend to live in the cities and the working class of all races. Uh, now there are divisions within the working class on race, on religion, ethnicity, and so on we can talk about, but they're priced out. They don't live in central Paris. They don't live in downtown London. They don't live in midtown Manhattan, right? And that's, so you get these maps or a geographic expression of this class divide. All right, so now with this class divide, you say that the contemporary, uh, the current problem of immigration, or the, the debate about immigration policy has to be seen to some degree in light of this class division. I mean, how, what is the connection exactly? Well, it has to do with the distributional effects and the costs and benefits. Uh, <clears throat> and again, uh, in ordinary politics, if you talk like me, you should not run for office, okay? If you're gonna be a politician or an activist, you have to say there's only, there's only the public interest and then what is good for the, the whole, the nation state, for America, the world, whatever it is. And then people who disagree are evil or stupid. They simply don't understand uh, what's good or they're just personally malevolent. Uh, so I'm, I'm approaching this as an analyst having spent most of my life in public policy in Washington, D.C. Every policy has winners and losers. There are distributional effects. Uh, generally, the people pushing for the policies are the winners. Now, maybe there are cases of mass delusion where people push for policies that are harmful for them. Usually, that gets corrected in time. The people who oppose them, maybe it's a delusion that they just think they're losing and they've been deceived. But in some cases, at the very least, they're not gaining from it. Uh, so when it comes to immigration, uh, there are clear class distributional effects. Uh, the, there have been two kind of gold standard reports that almost everybody respects from the National Academy of Sciences. It's bipartisan, academic. One was in 1996, one was in uh, 2016. And they both had pretty much the same conclusion. So immigration uh, and we're just looking at uh, unskilled immigration right here. We can have a separate conversation about, uh, about uh, college-educated immigrants. But this is uh, unskilled or low-wage immigration. It generally comes to a couple of conclusions. It increases GDP, gross domestic product, which is just a mathematical certainty because GDP is calculated by the workforce times productivity. If you expand the workforce, GDP goes up, right? So by definition, all immigration increases GDP. Uh, there are different distributional effects. Uh, the distributional effects of immigration, according to the National Academy of Sciences, uh, they hurt both natives and uh, previous immigrants with the lowest levels of education. That is high school dropouts and high school graduates because they're competing with unskilled immigrants for jobs. So it tends to lower their wages. Uh, in the first generation, they argue that this changes after the second, third generation. Uh, unskilled immigrants uh, re remove more from the welfare state than they pay in taxes, putting into it. Uh, so, okay, so that, that's the costs. Uh, so then the question was, what are the benefits? And there you have to break it down country by country. So it's different in Britain than it is in the United States. It's different in Canada than it is. So in the United States, we have this very polarized immigration system where uh, most countries in the, most Western democracies have a system in which about two thirds 
of immigrants are skilled immigrants. They have what is called a point system. You get a point if, for example, Canada, Australia, Britain. They give you points if you speak English. If you have a college diploma, you get points and so on. So it's about two thirds uh, based on skills and education. About a third is based on other factors of which the two most important are family unification. That is, you're related to somebody already in the country and, and you reunite the families. Or uh, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, asylees and refugees. Uh, the United States, for historical reasons we can get into, as the reverse of that. Going back to the 1965 uh, 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 Immigration and Naturalization Act, we're about two thirds family unification and about one third uh, other categories. And of, of the educated workers we have, the majority of them are squeezed in through a non-immigrant visa program, the H-1B program, which you may have heard about, uh, often uh, and through universities. So it's, it's very important on universities, uh, students who come from foreign countries as university students, and then get a sponsor who's an employer for an H-1B. Uh, and it's, it's a very exploitative system in as much as it's indentured servitude, strictly speaking, you're bound to that employer. If you cannot quit without going back to your home country, right? So it's quite different from a point system of the kind that you have, say, in Canada, where if you meet the points, you get a green card, you become what in the U.S. is called a legal permanent resident. If your boss mistreats you, you can quit and then get another job in Canada. That's not the system here that we have for a lot of these highly educated H-1Bs. So we have a very polarized immigration system where because of family reunification, uh, it benefited chiefly uh, citizens of Latin American descent from Mexico and Central America uh, who were largely rural in the, in the same way most of the European immigrants were 100 years ago, nothing new there, uh, and with large families. So, uh, so you had this rapid expansion of this largely rural, unskilled uh, uh, population through family reunification. And then at the top, much smaller, uh, it's less than 100,000 a year, you have these highly skilled contract workers. Uh, and then there's a diversity quota and, and there's uh, uh, refugees and asylees and so on. So uh, what you find looking at the polls in both the US and Europe, and this is pretty much true in all industrial democracies, there is no popular backlash against uh, skilled immigrants, right? It tends to be against the less skilled immigrants uh, where the opponents of, of that category, whether they're right or wrong, we can debate, they say they're dependent on welfare uh, and they drive down wages at the bottom. Uh, and it can take on nasty ethnic nativist overtones in some countries, but it's not necessarily racist. So for example, in Britain, uh, there was a backlash against so-called Polish plumbers because under the EU's move, uh, free mobility rules, a lot of Eastern Europeans were coming and competing with low-wage uh, Brits in the, the low, lower working class labor market. And, and they just became known proverbially as the Polish plumber. Uh, so so you, it, it's, it's a mess, it's, it's a mess. You have uh, concerns about economic competition. You get uh, concerns about rapid cultural change which have always tended to lead to backlashes. Uh, there was a huge backlash against German Americans led by, among others, Benjamin Franklin back in the uh, 18th century. He thought too many Germans were moving to, uh, to Philadelphia and he said they will never assimilate and uh, they're horrible people and we should keep them out. Uh, you know, so you, you get these waves of nativist uh, backlash. Uh, but. The thing is, you can't simply dismiss uh, the backlash against immigration. Yeah, sometimes it's just pure racism and nativism, right? You just don't like those people. Uh, but, but there are differences in the costs and the benefits. Uh, and, you know, if, if we have a growing amount of jobs, which the uh, economist uh, David Autor calls wealth work, it's things, uh, mostly big city jobs doing menial services for rich people. Right, it, it's like dog walkers, you know, and spa workers, and, and, and these kinds of categories. And 
so you're getting this kind of polarized class system in cities like New York and San Francisco, Los Angeles, even in Austin, where I live, which has now become a big metropolis, where the working classes of all races get forced out by the high rents. You get this very high-end professional managerial elite, and then you get people who are directly or indirectly servants, basically, or service providers, right, who tend to be very poorly paid, you know, no benefits, no unions, that sort of thing. So, uh, so I, I think you, you, you just can't understand what's going on without seeing this kind of three-way system where within, you have these two classes within the big cities, London, Paris, New York, you know, Austin, Minneapolis maybe, which is the high-end professionals, the managers, the managerial class, and people who are kind of doing Downton Abbey work for them in many cases, uh, if you recognize the, the reference. Uh, then out in the outer suburbs and the small towns, you get not only the older rural people, but you also get people who used to live in the cities but were driven out. So white working class. It's also African American working class, Latino working class, and others, and, and aspirational immigrants who see working in New York or LA as a temporary way station before they move out to the suburbs and and their dollar goes farther and maybe they get paid a little more. I had an editor at the New York Times who kept complaining that her maids kept mo quitting and moving to Long Island. I thought, good for them. <laughs> so you think that the American system needs to be adjusted in light of this analysis and what sorts of proposals do you make? Well, there were, I, I don't make any detailed proposals. Uh, Partly because I think for political reasons, we're further away from having any kind of uh, uh, comprehensive legislation on immigration reform than we were 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, but but my you, ha you have proposed things like we need to move in the direction of skills and the consumption Yeah, the yeah, and here I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm following uh, actually Democratic Party tradition. Uh, President Carter and President Clinton both appointed uh, immigration reform commissions. One was uh, headed by Father Theodore Hesburgh, who was the head of uh, Notre Dame. And that report came out in 1981. And then uh, Barbara Jordan, uh, first African-American representative uh, since Reconstruction from Texas, uh, whom I knew slightly. Uh, my, my aunt uh, helped her on her memoir and she performed the wedding ceremony for my cousin. So she was the... Uh, 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 the Jordan Commission, appointed by President Bill Clinton, came out with a report, and it seemed reasonable at the time. Uh, they said, by all means, we want to keep family unification, you know, bring over your parents, you know, bring over your children. Uh, but we have all these categories of siblings and cousins and, and these gradations, and that just leads to this kind of huge, it's called chain migration which some people think is insulting, but that was the, it wasn't, originally it was an academic term, right? So you just have, you, you kind of limit it to immediate nuclear family. Uh, you emphasize skilled immigrants, right? Because of the thought that uh, we're not creating a lot of well-paid jobs for unskilled people in advanced industrial society. And you have employer enforcement because if employers have to obey the law and hire citizens and legal permanent residents, that is green card, card workers, then the illegal immigration problem kind of dries up because there's no demand. And you don't need to fortify the border and build walls and, and do all of this. Uh, so this was the perspective of the labor wing of the Democratic Party in the 1980s and 1990s. Well, as you all know, things have changed. In the days of abolish ICE, and, and the parties have flipped on, on uh, immigration. So t Senator Tom Cotton, conservative Republican from uh, Arkansas, has a bill, I think it's called the RAISE Act. They all have to have these clever acronym names. I don't even know what the acronym means. It's essentially the Clinton-Jordan Commission recommendations. It's been universally denounced as xenophobic and nativistic and fascist and racist by Democrats now. Uh, you had, you had a glimpse of the older Democratic uh, Party line when uh, Ezra Klein, uh, the editor of uh, Vox, interviewed Bernie Sanders in 2016. And so Ezra 
So what do you think of the idea of just having open borders? And there's a YouTube video you can look up if you're interested. Bernie Sanders says, that's a terrible idea. That's a right wing idea. That's the Koch brothers. That will drive down wages. And he says, you know, we want to help raise wages in the rest of the world through development, but not by driving down wages in the US. So for you younger people, the liberal position for most of the 20th century was moderate restriction of immigration for labor reasons, create tight labor markets. All the way up until the 2000s, it was right-wing Republicans and libertarians who were against immigration enforcement, against workplace enforcement, uh, because they, they uh, wanted, Milton Friedman, uh, the, the greatest influence on, on conservative economic thinking, uh, wanted open borders. Uh, and th I, I promise I'll only do this once, but uh, the quote, I, I can't memorize these things. Uh, I know the feeling. But, yeah. but so I have a quote from Milton Friedman, who if you're not familiar with him, uh, very influential libertarian economist. Uh, and much of what the free market conservatives uh, do to this day in terms of policy goes back to his book, uh, Capitalism and Freedom, published in 1962. So this is uh, Professor Friedman. If you have a welfare state, if you have a state in which every resident is promised a certain minimal level of income or a minimum level of subsistence, regardless of whether he works or not, produces it or not, then free immigration is really an impossible thing. So Friedman's solution was to have open borders but get rid of the welfare state. Just abolish social security and the minimum wage, everything else, right? Uh, Paul Krugman, who's I think is safe to say as a liberal economist, is kind of the opposite of Milton Friedman. He agrees uh, in an op-ed he wrote uh, a few years back. He said, because modern America is a welfare state and quote, low skill immigrants don't pay enough taxes to cover the cost of the benefits they receive, unquote. Krugman concluded that, quote, the political threat that low-skill immigration poses to the welfare state is more serious than to its uh, other con uh, consequences. So here you have both uh, Milton Friedman and Paul Krugman agreeing that if you have a welfare state, you're gonna restrict immigration somehow because otherwise the voters will rebel. Uh, you know, and if you look at the most generous Scandinavian welfare states, like the Swedish welfare state, historically they had very long residency requirements. You had to live in Sweden for decades before you qualified. Uh, and you had to have paid in through payroll taxes. And that's because the classic 20th century welfare state, maybe it will be different in the 21st century, the 22nd, uh, it's essentially a deal by which the working class majority right now is paying uh, other members of the working class majority who are retired or disabled or unemployed. Uh, and that assumes that this is kind of a closed club. I mean, you can admit members on whatever plan you want, uh, but it's not anybody who joins the club instantly gets the benefits. There has to have been some kind of record. And a lot of uh, Western countries have uh, treaties, like social security tax treaties, do you know about this? So uh, they will count years spent in France by an American expatriate towards payments into social security when the American comes back to the US who's been a citizen the whole time and retires. So, and, and, uh, and this is something I think particularly progressives nowadays, uh, uh, they, they, they tend to dismiss uh, the fairness criticism of uh, participation and eligi eligibility for uh, welfare state benefits. But it really is fundamental to the deal, not just in countries with stingy, miserly welfare states like the United States, but ones with very generous welfare states in, in uh, Northern Europe. In fact, the Danes have the most draconian immigration laws now, as well as one of the most uh, generous welfare states. Uh, and they've been requiring potential uh, refugees to turn over any money they have, any jewelry, anything, uh, while they're on probation to see if they qualify under laws of asylum, which seems kind of harsh to me. Uh, but but that's, that's an element of this debate. How does immigration interact with a welfare state? 
your position, abstracting for the moment, uh, uh, for the moment from the issue of racism, let's just put that aside for a second. It sounds to me like Trump's position. Is that fair or an unfair characterization? Well, I, I think Trump, uh, you know, there, he has made racist remarks. You know, talking about shithole countries, right. if, if I can quote our president, uh, in Africa versus Norway. I mean, that's racist. You know, uh, uh, now the the press and I used, I've, I worked for the New Yorker, you know, I, the New Republic, the Harper's Magazine, but the press is 99.9% .9 liberal democratic. I'm just telling you, basis of experience. There are no Republicans in the offices of the New Yorker or CNN or anywhere like that. Maybe in the business side. Uh, so there is a narrative where everything Trump says uh, is fitted into the narrative that he's a deranged, you know, neo-Nazi, which I think is, is going too far. But no, my position, I say it's the Barbara Jordan position. Uh, you but, know, but and it, it's abstracting, from, again, extracting from the, the, the racism dimension, practically, what is the difference between your position? Oh, there's a huge and difference. There's a huge difference it? between my position and Trump's. And that is, uh, 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 the wall is kabuki theater, <laughs> right? As we say in Washington, it's like this very elaborate Japanese drama where all the stuff is going on and not very much happens. Uh, if you've ever watched uh, kabuki theater, I, mean, I don't want to insult Japanese culture, but, but uh, uh, that's the political phrase. Uh, so, as I said, if, if the Republicans were serious about reducing illegal immigration, they would have universal e-verify. That, that is, and this is something that was proposed by the Jordan Commission and in a version by Hesburgh. Uh, you just fine or imprison employers who knowingly hire illegal immigrants. And, uh, and the e-verify works to make sure that the social security numbers, and there's another number called an ITIN number for, for non-citizens, that, that this has not been stolen. Uh, there are two, two or three million Americans whose social security numbers have been stolen and are being used by illegal immigrants in the workforce now. I am one. I was surprised last spring. I got a letter from the IRS. It says, your social security number has been stolen. It is being used by someone uh, in the workplace in the United States. We cannot tell you who it is or where it is. Uh, it is your responsibility to contact the credit rating agencies to uh, make sure your credit is not ruined. So I thought, okay, thank you, my government. So I contacted Experian and they said, well, so I said, well, can you monitor this? And they said, no, you have to check back every 90 days to make sure your credit is not ruined by the Michael Lind, who is working at this very moment somewhere in the United States. Now, it is pr the odds are, th I have no resentment towards this individual. You know, it's large, probably an undocumented immigrant who's working in some terrible job for a suburban construction contractor or in a kitchen or something like that. These are exploited laborers, right? I, I want them to have a path to citizenship and become citizens and have rights and vote, okay? So, but the thing is the media is not telling you the truth about uh, uh, this stuff. about So when, when you have the phrase undocumented, you can't get a job in, in much of the United States if you don't have documents. They have fake documents or they have stolen documents, right? So how did, uh, this other Michael Lind, who's working probably for terrible wages and horrible conditions, get my social security number and my name and address and all of this. Well, these individuals are not adept at computer hacking, okay? Only international criminal gangs and certain foreign governments are capable of hacking the social security administration's agencies. We know a couple of foreign states that have done this, right? Uh, so how does it get to the employer? Well, I happen uh, to be told this by some illegal immigrants whom I knew uh, working in, in Washington, D.C. There are places you can go where sometimes the employer gets it directly. Sometimes the uh, individuals, the workers get it. So, th so the boss will say, okay, look, go to this lawyer, go to this store, pay a certain, you know, a couple hundred dollars and they give you an ITIN, they give you a social security number, like mine, right? Uh, well, they got it from the mafia, 
They got it from transnational criminal gangs, which may have gotten it from state-supported foreign hacking, okay? Uh, one of the reasons I, I think there is this backlash, you know, that fueled Trumpism, was essentially f f ever since the Reagan years, the federal government under both parties took a blasé attitude towards this, right? So uh, it's true of George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama. Uh, yeah, three million Americans had their social security numbers stolen. You know, maybe we'll notify them. I was surprised to be notified. They've only, they haven't done that until recently. But then they say, well, uh, the Social Security Administration cannot tell the IRS or, you know, and, and so on. So there's no communication. So right now, there's a court case in one case, I think it's Kansas, maybe it's somewhere else, can individuals sue, right? You know, the government for not enforcing the law if, if their identity has been stolen. Uh, so that's why I do think there's a class element in this. That is the elite Democrats and the elite Republicans think, okay, yeah, big deal. This is fine. We'll just live with this, right? Yeah. But you do say that in the competition among the great powers internationally, the United States has to be concerned about productive capacity in that competition and developing innovation and productive capacity and that sort of thing. And you tie that in certain moments to a proposal on immigration, which is that we ought to be focused on those who can contribute to that product productive capacity and we need to move in a direction other than the one that we are have cur currently embraced. Yeah. Isn't that fair? Yeah, I think and that we're, we're in the early stages of Cold War II, uh, where the major adversary is China. Russia is right now on the Chinese side, but could flip. But this is a long-term geopolitical and economic competition with China. And it's just, it's not like the competition with the Soviet Union in Cold War I. Uh, the, the Chinese are not spreading, you know, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, Xi Jinping thought. It's not an ideological competition. It's more like 19th century Europe versus France. It's great power competition, right? We're competing for markets, competing to dominate 5G, competing to dominate AI. It's largely economic. It's also diplomatic. There's a military element to it. Uh, and the strength of your manufacturing base and your scientific and technological base is, is critical to this. And, and we can't take it for granted the way we could in Cold War I. Because in Cold War I, the uh, Soviet Union uh, was essentially a third world country that was mostly frozen with nuclear weapons. And they had some very good native engineers, but a lot of the stuff they did, as we, we did, we got them from German rocket scientists after World War II. And thank God we got the good German rocket scientists, you know, like Werner von Braun, and, and they got the second tier ones. Uh, uh, China has surpassed us in manufacturing capability already. Uh, it has surpassed us in GDP according to one measure, purchasing power parity. According to the other measure, market exchange rates, it will pass us by 2030. The United States, the whole time since the Civil War, we've been a great power. We've never been number two economically, you know, and industrially. And we still have a lead over China in many areas. But I think this is going to concentrate our minds. And so it's lead, I can tell you, it's leading to a rethinking in Washington among, among both progressives and conservatives of this kind of complacent attitude we had after the end of the Cold War that we're number one, we're the unipolar you know, superpower, you know, we'll police the world forever. If people want to take manufacturing from us, fine. You know, we have finance, we have Hollywood. Uh, you know, in, in terms of immigration, there wasn't this sense that we are competing for talent, right, with the rest of the world because we just thought we are so far ahead technologically that it will take ages for them to catch up. So I think we need to rethink this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would, I would. That, that is Trump's position, is it not? I mean, that we need to be focused on that with respect to immigration. That is to say, bringing in people who can contribute to productive capacity and less concerned about the other kinds of rationales for admitting persons into yeah, the United Yeah, that, that's his position. It was also the position of Marco Rubio and uh, Senator Schumer, 
in 2013-2014, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, there have been two attempts, both failures for political reasons, at comprehensive immigration reform in this century. The first was in 2006 to 2007, and the second was in 2013-2014. And they were both fairly sensible from my perspective. And they kind of followed the Hesburgh and the Jordan Commission approaches. You would, you would keep family unification, but you would trim the cousins you know, somewhat, keep more nuclear family. Uh, you would greatly expand the skilled, uh, have a point system, so that uh, if, if you uh, come here from Asia or Africa or the Middle East or Latin America, go to the university, then you could get a, a green card without having to be bound to Infosys or Apple or whatever as an H-1B. Uh, there would be employer enforcement, E-Verify. Uh, they both, so I, it's just fairly, and you would have a path to citizenship, right, for most of the people who are already here, you know, who are un unauthorized. So it's fairly sensible bipartisan approach. Uh, President Trump, with his proposal on DACA, on, on deferred uh, action, for the children who came here when they're very young, uh, that is essentially an amnesty, uh, because what it would in, in citizenship, uh, because what it would do is, if you grant an amnesty for these people who came when they're very young but had been born abroad, because they're they can then bring in their relatives, they can retroactively uh, ex you get citizenship for their parents, right, who brought them here, so it's it's actually a de facto. Amnesty, and he seems quite sincere in his desire to do this for the wall. My problem with the wall is, I think this is a, a symbolic stunt. Uh, and he's a great showman, and I think that he, he promised this wall, and he will run in 2020 saying, I promise to defeat ISIS, I promise to do this, I promise to do that, and here's a picture of the wall, right in Arizona or Texas or whatever. Uh, as I say, I don't think that's a, if, if you have employer enforcement, the, but so the wall unites the Republican Party because it does not threaten the employers, right? If, you, if uh, the president came out and said, we need universal mandatory E-Verify for all businesses tomorrow, lots of landscapers, realtor, you know, real estate developers, uh, sweatshops you know, uh, in, in the ag industry, they're going to fight back because their model is based on um, unauthorized non-unionized, you know, non-citizen labor. So, so that's where I will in continue to insist on distinguishing my view from the president's. Uh, now might be a good time to entertain questions from the audience. Um, if there are some, uh, we, would just, we would just ask that people speak into a microphone. Uh, first raise your hand and speak into a microphone and pose the question. Keep your hand up to identify yourself. Okay, so you mentioned that if, um, hypothetically, Trump mentioned that uh, he wanted to make E-Verify something that was mandatory for all businesses, uh, do you believe that these uh, businesses would fight back on that E-Verify, or would they push for legislation that would make it so that the workers would have an easier path to citizenship? Well, so your classic employers, if, if you read Adam Smith, Adam Smith, and he's always being cited by conservatives, he's a great champion of capitalism, he had a very low opinion of businessmen and merchants. He preferred farmers. He thought family farmers were the pillar of society. He really despised capitalists. Uh, and he has a great passage in The Wealth of Nations where he says that any uh, em employer given the option of a slave instead of a paid worker, would take the slave, right? And it's not simply, he says, because it's cheaper. He says, because in the human breast, there's this lust for domination, this, this lust to lord it over people. And he attributes this to employers. So, and I think there was something very psychologically acute about that. Because if you look at H-1Bs, and some of my friends have been H-1Bs, uh, they are really uh, fairly well paid compared to the average American. You know, I mean, they're some are making six-figure salaries. You know, they're doing tech work, they're doing professional work, but they live in fear, and they're willing to take abuses, which uh, citizen workers and legal permanent residents with green cards, but because they would quit, right? The single 
uh, biggest labor right is the right to quit your job and take another job without leaving the country, right? All guest worker programs bind you to one employer, the sponsor. And if you upset that employer, you have to go back home to your country, right? Now, they're nice employers who let you go work for somebody else, right? Uh, but to me, this is something that isn't discussed very much. In fact, one of the my pet peeves is people discuss guest workers and call them immigrants. According to the federal government, guest workers, H-1Bs, J-Visas, H-2As in agriculture, are not immigrants. They are called non-immigrant visas. No matter how long you work in the United States, this does not count start the clock ticking towards the five years to where if you have a green card, you become a citizen, right? Uh, so technically, these are not immigrants. They are contract workers who are foreign uh, nationals. And the reason I'm raising this to answer your question is one of the reasons why the 2006 bill died and the uh, 2014 bill died is because the Republicans, the Democrats agreed on everything else. The Republican employer lobby, which is much weaker now under Trump because Trump has brought in more working class base than the old country club Republicans. It was very powerful un under uh, uh, the Bushes. Uh, they said, well, if you take away illegal immigrant workers, you have to give us millions of new contract laborers every year. You can't force us to hire not only citizens and, and green card employees, but also the amnesty to immigrants who are now citizens. They insisted that the Congress give them in compensation. They just need a workforce that can't vote and can't quit and can't unionize, which, well, so who objected to this? The private sector labor unions. So uh, uh, the AFL-CIO, the others, uh, the, the bills, both bills collapsed because labor withdrew its support when the only way to pass it was to give the ag industry and the hotel industry uh, these non-citizen guest workers forever, just endlessly, millions a year. Uh, so, you know, and, and that, that was the deal breaker. All the other stuff, the left, the right agreed on. But it was the insistence of the employers that you cannot ask us to hire people with basic labor rights and political rights. And that's what killed the deal. Question here. Hi, so I have a two-part question. Sure. Um, firstly, do you believe that there is either a role or a responsibility for an element of humanitarianism in American immigration policy, especially in light of the influence that America has had in shaping the world and many of the conflicts in the world, both through countries that America has intervened in or just general refugees? And secondly, um, if you do believe that there is a humanitarian role, but that the effects of that are offset by the detrimental effects that immigration has on the American workforce? Don't you believe that the fact that we're dealing with a zero-sum game and that either way someone is going to be marginalized and exploited is indicative of a greater overall problem and that the solution is something much greater and more inclusive than immigration reform? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, as uh, Professor Santori said, I come out of the, what I consider the Rooseveltian tradition of, of liberal internationalism. Uh, the main way you help poor countries uh, is not through immigration policy because the United States has 4% of the world's population. Uh, and you're only going to be able, even with the most generous policy, uh, you're not going to solve the problems of those countries by having people move here en masse. Uh, the problems of the post-colonial world that result from European imperialism, the parts of Mexico and Central America that the U.S. messed up, with our imperialism. Uh, ultimately, the test is to get these countries uh, on a development path towards democracy, the rule of law, economics. Uh, and they're not going to develop economically by sending people to the US, or for that matter, to the EU. Uh, so on the development side, I'm, I'm in favor of development. So what do you do that's positive? You invest in infrastructure in those countries, right? 
you know, you, you penalize authoritarian regimes and anti-worker regimes if necessary. Uh, you you sh have technological and, and uh, uh, commercial exchange. Uh, but just you're not going to make any country prosperous by having people, particularly its most enterprising people, leave and come here. So the economic development thing, I think, is totally different from the refugee. I think the United States, since World War II, under the Genocide Convention and, and under various United Nations laws, under international law, we're bound to help uh, refugees, you know, who are genuinely uh, in, in fear of extermination, right? We are not bound to help people who are poor because most people in the world are much poorer than we are. Uh, there, there's a dispute uh, right now over whether in these uh, gang-ridden countries like Central America, fear of being killed by the mafia uh, is like the same thing as being a Jew escaping Nazi Germany. You know, there are arguments on both sides. On the other hand, given gang violence in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, I mean, if you're really going to take that, you should say that, well, people from Chicago should apply for amnesty in, you know, Stockholm or somewhere. So I think that's a, that's a debatable case, but I could see the case for it. Uh, but here's the thing. Your classic refugee is reluctant. It's a reluctant refugee. They want to come home, Right? You know, uh, they want to go back to their countries after the evil regime is overthrown, rebuild their lives, right? Now, there's some cases where it's so completely traumatic where you never want to go back if you're a Jew chased out of Nazi Germany. Uh, in the case of refugees from the Soviet Union, it lasted for 70 years, right? You sort of give up hope of ever going home again after a while. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, that's the thing. You have to distinguish the genuine refugees that these post-1945, they're called displaced persons in, in after World War II. You have to distinguish that from the hundreds of millions of people who are poor people in poor countries. <coughs> and they would, they want to move and get jobs. <coughs> and Excuse me, and, and I'm going to drink a little of this. You know, to the U.S. or Canada or... Western Europe, uh, and they're, they're not refugees in the classic sense. They're economic migrants. So what do you say about the Central Americans? The Central Americans, uh, it's, it's actually similar to the Syrian refugee problem in uh, Europe, where uh, under international law, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert on this, uh, the first safe country in which the refugee arrives has the obligation to house and clothe and feed them, right? Uh, now, this uh, in realistically, this does not happen because if you're a refugee from a poor country and then the next door country is safe but is poor, right, you're better off if you keep going through multiple countries until you arrive in Germany, right, or until you arrive in France or Britain or, you know, the United States. Uh, but that, that, as I understand, that is the rule. Right, so if you're in fleeing Honduras and it's safe uh, you know, in Mexico, then Mexico is obliged to help you. Right? They're, they're not obliged to wave you on through to the US border. Now having said that, if we have people amassing at the US border as we do now, uh, raise my taxes, right? Pay for beds, pay for humane treatment. We're a rich, decent society, okay? but. At the end of the day, and this will be true even if the Democrats now are all running essentially saying nothing about any restrictions on immigration or any enforcement. It's just abolish ICE, ambiguous slogan. If you have President Warren or President Harris or President Sanders, that president is going to enforce immigration law. I mean, it's the law. You're commander in chief. President Obama enforced immigration law, right? So we will continue to have a system in which there's a specialized system of immigration courts where they, you go through the application, you, you apply for asylum, and the judges decide whether you merit it or not. And if you don't merit it, you don't get it. And that's true of all uh, countries, right? There's some kind of decision-making process. So it should be generous, uh, but on the other hand, it can't be indiscriminate because what you're doing then and it hurts the real refugees. I keep saying genuine refugees. There are lots of genuine refugees. 
uh, you're getting people who claim persecution when they really just want a job or a better life in a first world country. But they're not in actual danger of being killed by a genocidal regime or maybe murdered by gangsters. It's like they want a better life, right? So for those people, you can say, well, increase the legal immigration quota if you want to admit more of them, more economic migrants, but they're economic migrants. They're not refugees, and this is not my distinction. I mean, this is international law, as I understand it. So what do you say to the libertarian type who says, well, you know, let's go with open borders and just let the market sort it out? Well, I, the libertarians are not fond of me <laughs> because I wrote a widely cited article in Salon about a decade ago with the, uh, asking the question, why are there no libertarian countries? <laughs> so if this whole open borders, no minimum wage, no welfare state system is such a great idea, you would think at least one country would have tried it, right? I mean, all other political systems, we have real world national examples, right? I mean, we still have Marxist-Leninist states you know, in North Korea and Cuba and, and China, right? They functioned, right? I mean, you know, they functioned terribly. In the case of, of the Soviet Union and China, millions of people starved. You know, others died in, in prison camps. But yeah, communist countries can work in a bad sort of tyrannical way. You know, fascist countries, if they'd not been defeated militarily, might survive to this day, right? They wouldn't have necessarily fallen apart. Uh, why isn't like one, now I say that having said that, uh, libertarians periodically, about once a decade, they announce that they have founded a libertarian utopia on an abandoned and repurposed oil derrick, or in one case like a sandbar in the middle of the Rio Grande River, uh, separating Texas from, and there's this great flurry of news articles saying that, so the, the most recent example of this was about a decade ago, where Patry Friedman, the nephew of Milton Friedman, the economist, uh, wrote an essay for the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, at which I have many friends. I like libertarians. I just think they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> proposed, and he and wrote this very intelligent essay. He said, look, Libertarian Party gets maybe one or two percent of the vote in the United States. It's true in other democracies. Let's face it, this nation state democracy thing is bad for libertarians. They don't like us, these voters. So we'll form our own countries. So he created something called the Seastead Foundation, which was to raise money to buy abandoned oil derricks and turn them into sovereign countries that libertarians could move to. Now they would be in places like San Francisco Bay. So I remarked on this and I made the rather unkind uh, suggestion that they should try it in the waters off of Somalia, haunted by pirates, to, to be a real test of their system, right? Not <laughs> right off of Marin County and, and Berkeley. So, uh, uh, but this, I mean, look it up. It's the CSED Foundation. I think they folded a few years ago. Uh, so does that answer your question? It does, <laughs> in some measure, yeah. Um, other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, the points made um, have uh, been on welfare, and uh, um, a large body of research indicates that curtailment of welfare rights is unlikely to appreciably stem the flow of new migrants because the availability of social services or entitlements is not a powerful magnet for would-be unauthorized entrants as compared with other demand pull factors. Um, so talking about welfare and talking about E-Verify and how you want to enforce it in a way. Um, and it, and uh, it sounds like you may also, if you, tr if you do enforce E-Verify, uh, people will become unemployed, undocumented, unskilled workers, which you mentioned you did want a path to no, well, you let, you let, Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. You're absolutely right. Uh, there are proposals now and then to uh, punish not only illegal immigrants, but legal immigrants by denying them welfare. Uh, it's a terrible idea because the main uh, uh, 
pull factor is a job. It's employment, right? Now, uh, I would not implement E-Verify without a amnesty and path to citizenship. So everyone who, if, if it goes into effect, you know, January 1st, uh, 2021, uh, every unauthorized immigrant who, and then you have, yeah, you have to sort out like criminals and, and so on. Most are otherwise law abiding apart from, you know, the, the uh, legal documents or whatever. They would have instant legal status to remain in their jobs, right? until they acquire citizenship, which I would grant as rapidly as possible, even though it's kind of unfair that you've jumped the line. I mean, it is unfair, right? Because people from the same countries have been you know, waiting for years or decades, and then somebody jumps the line and gets citizenship. Nevertheless, there's an overriding public purpose. And the overriding public purpose is everyone who works in a democracy should have identical rights, including the right to vote and the right to unionize, right? And the right to quit your employer. So uh, I would not do E-Verify and then have 12 million people suddenly unemployed in a few cities in Texas and California and New York. It would have to be part of an amnesty system. Uh, but th so this is essentially telling the employers, right? You're not gonna lose your workers that you presently have, but from now on, you just can't do this anymore, right? You can't use forged documents. You can't use stolen social security numbers. You know, that we're, we're shutting down what is essentially a transnational criminal mafia system of, of obtaining and selling uh, people's identity. It's identity theft. It, it, it's international identity theft run by criminal organizations, right? In this hemisphere and in the old world. And that's just, we need to shut that down, right? Uh, but so I would not punish the, the workers. I would, I would make them citizens at an expedited uh, pace. As a matter of fact, in the New York Times uh, about a decade ago, uh, I, I published an op-ed proposing that we shrink the five-year uh, status, you know, for the residency requirements. Right now, you, you, when you get a green card, it takes five years before you can apply for citizenship. And I suggested shrinking it to two. I would get rid of it altogether, but I thought I, that's a bit too radical. By the way, do you know why there's this five-year requirement? It all goes back to the Jefferson administration and the Adams administration. So when the French Revolution broke out, we had two parties in the United States, the Federalists, who were kind of the New England conservatives, and the Southern Agrarians, the Jeffersonians, who were called the Republicans in those days. Uh, they later became the Democratic Republicans and then the Democrats. Uh, and so the biggest group of uh, immigrants were Irish Catholics from Ireland uh, who tended to favor the French Revolution because the English hated it and being Irish, whatever the English hated, they were for, right? So the Federalists were convinced that all these Irish immigrants were spies and agents of the Jacobins in revolutionary Paris. And so what had been, I think the original was five years, it was something like that, the residency requirement, they stretched it, I believe, to 14 years. I'd have to check. So basically, the Irish immigrant had to be under the observation of his or her neighbors for 14 years just to make sure they weren't radical, subversive, French Jacobin secret agents, right? Uh, so the Jeffersonians come in. Uh, the uh, Jefferson and Madison, as uh, part of the Southern Party, they established the Southern Alliance with the Irish uh, American political machines in New York and other Northeastern cities. As early as the Jefferson administration, Tammany Hall already existed. That was the, you know, the Irish dominated democratic machine in New York City. So from their perspective, uh, the more Irish voters, the better, right? Uh, so they shrank it to uh, two years. Uh, and then eventually the five years was kind of a compromise it makes no sense whatsoever, right? I mean, you know, at, at this point, I'm not even sure why we do this. If you're going to give somebody a green card and, you know, you're, you should have done the due diligence as our government to make sure that they're not secret agents, right, or terrorists before. And, and if they are, how likely are they to, to tip their hand before they get the citizenship, 
right? So it, it's another case where in a lot of this, you just get historical inertia animating things. So if, if we implement what I understand to be the, the LIND policy, then we restrict the influx of low skill or low wage immigrant labor, protecting American workers. So wages go up, um, so labor costs go up. What's your read on the economics of how many jobs then disappear? And is that is that ultimately a net gain for um, lower skilled natives given what I take to be sort of conventional economic wisdom about the relationship between labor costs and jobs, un unemployment rates, et cetera? Well, the, the, the conventional wisdom, and you see this, in, and usually it's the minimum wage is kind of the proxy for these discussions because you're, you're raising the wage by a tight labor market, but it can be done by other measures. It can be done by a minimum wage law. Uh, and it creates transitional unemployment in some fields where the business model was based on the low wage labor. So if your business depends on low wage labor and the wage goes up for whatever reasons, it can be less, fewer low wage immigrants, it can be a $15 minimum wage, it can be they're unionized, right? But the, the price of labor goes off. Then you have to look on a case by case basis. Uh, is this something for which there is, is uh, what economists call inelastic demand, right? So even if it costs more, uh, people will still demand this. And if that's the case and you're an employer, you want to supply that demand. Uh, so you would try to do it in some labor-saving way. You, either you would invest in robots or AI or software, or you would change your inefficient business model to be more efficient by retraining people. It doesn't have to be technology. It often is. Uh, and, and you see this argument where people say, well, if you raise the minimum wage or alternately if you restrict low-wage immigration, this will lead invest, uh, people to have robots and automation. That's great. That's terrific, right? We, the dream of, of, uh, of society, I think, should be that any work that can be done by a machine or a computer program should be done by machines. So yes, there's transitional unemployment. There was transitional unemployment when automobiles replaced horses and the, you know, when the jackhammer replaced John Henry you know, in the uh, folk song uh, uh, with his individual hammer. There has never been mass technological unemployment in the entire history of the world since the Industrial Revolution began. And we're all, you're always seeing these scare stories about, oh, the coming wave of mass unemployment because of robots and AI and, and all of this. Maybe it will happen. It's never happened before. Uh, there have been temporary industries. There's been some transitional unemployment. But so why has this not happened? Well, let me backtrack. <clears throat> all of the great economic crises, like the Great Recession and the Great Depression, and we had depressions in the 19th century that were even worse, they came out of financial panics. So if you're worried about mass unemployment, you have to be worried about banking failures, where you have runs on the banks and financial panics, and not any financial panic. So the studies have shown that the financial panics that cause depressions are the ones that affect real estate and mortgages, including farm mortgages in the old rural days, but residential mortgages now. You can have a stock market bubble like the one in 2001 that pops, and you recover from it quickly. It doesn't affect many people because the stock market is owned largely by rich people. Yeah, you know, they lose some money. Uh, you don't get mass unemployment, mass uh, wealth loss. Uh, 2008, uh, 1929, it's when it, the contagion affects uh, real estate and, and middle class and working class homeowners. That's what causes depressions and mass unemployment. Technological uh, advance to date has not done so because you're, lo you're lowering the price of the good or service through productivity, right, with, with the machine. So something that used to have a labor cost, now it's just, you know, robots don't have high wages and need benefits and things like that. So the good or service is cheaper. So even people who are paid the same as they were before, and they can be working class people or poor people, 
they've got more discretionary income because the calculator, let's say, which cost like $80 in 1970, is a dollar fifty now, and they can spend that on other services, which we know from history tend to be labor-intensive quality of life services. As as food gets cheaper, as manufactured goods get cheaper, uh, as telecommunications gets cheaper, uh, even people without high incomes have more discretionary spending, and they go on more vacations, and they go out, you know, and they go shopping, and they have more recreation, and. Uh, so if you look at the jobs that are being created right now in the US and in Europe, it's exactly what you would expect to see as a result of productivity growth in an advanced technological economy. They're mostly personal face-to-face -face service jobs in quality of life industries like healthcare, uh, recreation, restaurants, where you could live without it. But you have a little spending money, right? You like go out to eat, right? You know, spend a little more on, on uh, health care. Uh, so I'm, I'm not worried about that uh, at, at all. But why, if I mean, yeah. just to follow, why, why aren't low-skilled, low-wage immigrants just functioning? Why aren't low-wage immigrants just functioning like the robots in the present regime, right? So they make everything cost less, and then everybody else has more money to spend. So actually, working-class Americans are benefiting from it. Right? Wouldn't, wouldn't the robots be interchangeable with um, the, the low-skill immigrants in terms of their function in the economy, which is just to lower the cost of production? Yes, they would if you are Jefferson Davis or if you are the Sultan of Dubai, right? I mean, I'm a Southerner myself. Uh, we tried this experiment uh, for 400 years of having, I like to say, workers who can't vote employed by voters who don't work, all right? This, this, this experiment did not end happily. Uh, so, you know, to me it's just, if you're gonna have a democratic republic, uh, it has to be based on what uh, Aristotle and the Greeks called isonomia, one law for all. You cannot have a caste of ethnically different people or people of different uh, nationality who are a permanent working class who have no realistic prospects for advancement. Uh, otherwise, you, you end up, as I said, Dubai. If you look at Dubai, Saudi Arabia, they have this native elite. They have the natives who have this very generous welfare state and so on. And then the, much of the work is done by imported, uh, often indentured servants from the Philippines and so on. So from a purely economic point of view, well, yeah. But on the other hand, if you're looking at this solely from an economic point of view, you can also lower prices by abolishing the minimum wage or by making people work uh, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, the way they did in 1900. So, you know, I, I think uh, it it's, it's ultimately gets down to political philosophy, what a democratic republic is. But, I mean, that, and I'll stop, I promise. But, I mean, that argument focuses on the, the, the good of the immigrants, whereas I, your, your lovely essay, which we read in my class, I thought the argument was about the benefit of native workers who were disenfranchised by the, by the managerial class. So the argument you're making now, I, I understand to be different. It's, it's basically an objection to a, a kind of permanent subclass, but it's not about the effects on native workers per se. No, just to make it clear, uh, I expect and support continued immigration to the U.S. and Western societies of, of some kind. I want those immigrants, once they get here, to join the prosperous working class as quickly as possible, right? So now any regime you have where you restrict the numbers compared to what it is now, there will be people in foreign countries who would have come here who do not, right? So there are people who use cosmopolitan ethical theory saying that you have to put the interest of the foreign national who wants to move to the US or Germany or Canada and treat them the same as the, the citizen who's already here. So yeah, yeah, I mean in a nation state, you put the interest of your nation state citizens first. But on the other hand, uh, I, I think if it's gonna be a democratic nation state, uh, you do not want to have a segmented labor force of any kind Right? So have, having indentured servants, you, you don't want to have people bound to employers. 
anyone who works in the United States should have the right to quit. I would get rid of H-1Bs, H-2As, J all of that stuff, uh, if, and give people green cards, right? If you're qualified to work in the U.S., you get a green card, or, you know, and, and you're a potential citizen. Uh, uh, and historically, this was the progressive liberal tradition. Uh, its enemies were indentured servitude. Uh, now, there was a racial element to this with the Chinese Exclusion Act, but the Asian workers who were, were not immigrants, they were contract labor who were being brought here, most of them. Uh, so uh, they went after contract labor, the unions and the left and the progressives. They went after prison labor, which in my part of the country in the South was a terrible exploitative thing, where essentially the prison warrants rented out the prisoners to northern corporations that owned the plantations and, and the, the you know, timber farms and the cotton farms, uh, child labor. So, so the ultimate vision is one where all workers in the country have identical rights and identical bargaining power, identical leverage against our class. Because let's face it, the college educated professional class, you know, we kind of have a buyer's market in, in low wage labor now. Right? And immigration is part of this. Uh, I read recently that only 5% of employers of nannies in the United States uh, obey the laws that govern nannies. That is, who pay their social... You're, if you have a nanny, you, you're supposed to pay the social security taxes to the IRS. You, you have to obey uh, wages and hours laws. You have to obey overtime laws. Nobody does. Nobody does. It's an incredibly exploitative system of mostly foreign-born women. Uh, and I think this should, is just outrageous. And who does it? It's people like me, right? I mean, I don't, I'm not married, and, and I don't have a, a kids, uh, but it's the professional upper-middle class, right, who have this system of labor exploitation, uh, and it's invisible in the media because everybody's doing it, right? So, you know, the question is what kind of society we're going to be. It should be a society in which all employers, including employers of household servants, uh, are bound to exactly the same labor law regime that giant corporations are. Uh, and this is why, we're getting back to what we we're started with, with the managerial professional class, uh, yet or we have exempted ourselves right, from this uh, uh, labor law regime. So sanctuary cities, Austin is a sanctuary city. This is portrayed as a great idealistic thing, and it is in some ways. I mean, there's some altruistic elements to it. But, I mean, come on. Uh, it also means that the mostly white, mostly native, upper middle class professionals who employ nannies and pay them off the books, and gardeners and, and you know, other people, uh, don't have to obey the social security rules. They don't have to obey employment laws, right? You know, so they're kind of protecting their own exploited labor force. Uh, so, and this is where I differ from uh, Trump and Trumpism, if you want to call it that. Uh, basically, what, what the president has done and the right uh, is it's kind of played by the Buchanan playbook, the paleoconservative playbook, right? These folks are a threat to our culture, they're criminals. That's all nonsense. Uh, uh, L Latino uh, immigrants are no more violent than natives, if you look at the statistics, right? Uh, uh, so playing up the crime all the time and all of this on right-wing websites, totally misleading. Uh, if you look at assimilation in terms of acquiring English, of uh, uh, you know, m m uh, intermarriage, various other uh, indices, uh, Latin American immigrants assimilated exactly the same rate as the Irish and the Poles and the Germans and the Swedes and Norwegians did in the past, right? So to me, this is largely an economic issue, but economic and political in as much as uh, if you want to have a, a working class with bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis employers, including individual households, they got to have leverage and, and they don't have workers, immigrant workers, native workers, they lack leverage nowadays. I think we have time for one more question, perhaps. There's one here. 
Um, so uh, in response to one of your earlier questions, you seemed very in support of um, foreign development and foreign trade. Yet at the beginning, you heavily emphasized the need to protect American manufacturing in what you see as leading up to the second Cold War. So to me, that seems somewhat those ideas don't necessarily line up with the idea of comparative advantage, where if it's cheaper for us to trade with these other countries to help them develop and then also lower the costs of products in the U.S., that would be the right choice, whereas at the same time, that would be taken away from American manufacturing. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that. Yeah, my answer, I'm not a Ph.D. economist. I've, I've studied a lot of this stuff. I'm lecturing to Danny Roderick's Harvard class, and his Harvard economics class and next month. Uh, but my, my background's a historian. Uh, ignore everything your econ professors teach you <laughs> about David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage because it's a wonderful little thought experiment. This is about whether the, uh, essentially, if you can do one activity better, you can do two activities better than somebody else, but you do one activity really better, then you should uh, let somebody else do the activity that you can do better but not as well. Not that much better, right? <laughs> to use the superlative. Uh, it makes no sense to base the industrial commercial policy of even a tiny nation state like Luxembourg on the thought experiment of a 19th century economist who's an incredibly brilliant figure. But it's a thought experiment, all right? I have searched for years. I have asked eminent economists, maybe someone here can tell me, where are the studies that prove that David Ricardo was right about comparative advantage? So where, like German-Polish trade, British trade with Chile, I mean, where are the historical case studies? There are none. Literally, they are teaching you a thought experiment that has never been tested in the real world of, of the economy. Now, what, so if you look at actual historical economics, which was the name of a school. It was called the American School of Economics in the 19th century. It was inspired by Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay, and Abraham Lincoln was part of it. And uh, it was spread to Europe by a, a German economist named Friedrich List. And around 1900, it was called the German Historical School, came back to the US, and was known as institutional e economics. And it was uh, driven off of the university campuses after 1945 and replaced by neoclassical <laughs> economics and Marxist to some extent. Uh, but according to this you know, historical school, institutional school, whatever you want to call it, uh, you can do any industry anywhere, any modern industry. You can make cars anywhere, right? You know, uh, the problem is the country that is the first one to have like a steel industry or an automobile industry, uh, the barriers to entry even in free trade, are so huge because, let's say if you're 19th century America, you're, you're completely agrarian and you want to catch up with the first industrial superpower, Britain, it's just really hard to break in, right? Because the British have these mills, right? And, and they have cotton mills and they're machine powered uh, and it takes a long time to build up your capacity. So you have infant industry tariffs, you have various kinds of protectionism until you catch up. Now in this, Classical historical theory, it's not protectionist as such. Once you catch up, then you liberalize, but you don't liberalize for the David Ricardo comparative advantage. Uh, you liberalize because it's in the interest of both parties to have the biggest integrated market for industries with increasing returns to scale, like manufacturing. Now, unlike Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, which I keep poking fun at, this theory has been tested and it's correct. So one of the things that neoclassical uh, economists can't explain is why is it that most advanced industrial nations import and export goods in the same industry, right? Because they shouldn't, right? So the US sells cars to Germany and imports cars to Germany. We sell consumer electronics to Japan and South Korea and they import from Japan, and sometimes it's different levels in the supply chain, but often it's like cars, right? You can get BMWs and Fords and things like that. Well, the answer is uh, what shapes the uh, pattern, the actual pattern of, of distribution of industry is the level of income and the uh, 
preferences of the consumers. So most trade, this is very important, most trade in the world is among rich industrial countries, right? Uh, it's, it's within the triangle of Northeast Asia, North America, and Europe, and it's largely trade in the same goods, which tend to be advanced manufacturing. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, and, if, and if you look at the U European Union and the United States, we have pretty balanced trade. The Germans have the, the kind of mercantilism, but it's pretty balanced. Uh, Japan, East Asia, there's always been a problem because the Japanese and South Koreans have protected their home markets by various non-tariff barriers while having free access to ours. But it was, a, it was something we live with. Uh, China, when you have, uh, as I say, what will soon be the world's largest economy, uh, wh where its major industrial corporations are state-owned enterprises, where the government will spend whatever it takes so that they don't go bankrupt, right? And they target your industries and are, are engaged in dumping which is something that classical economics is totally right about. Dumping is when you're selling below the cost of the product temporarily in order to destroy your rival. And then you know once your rival is driven out of business, you can then jack up your price, right? And you have a monopoly of, of that field. So when you're dealing with what was called mercantilist countries, like the People's Republic of China, it's not free trade. Right, because it's, it's not a level playing field. Now, if it were, and this is what the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, Obama, finally, they kind of gave up. They were hoping that China would become a more or less liberal economy, right? Like the Europeans or even the Japanese are somewhat liberal. Uh, and these, and their, their big companies would be real companies. They'd be capitalist enterprises not, not state-owned uh, corporations. Hasn't happened, it's been going the other way. Uh, so am I contradicting myself? No, because most of the, the growth in the future export markets for the US and other industrial nations that it pays to be part of are not in China proper. Uh, it's in India and Africa and the developing countries of Latin America and the Middle East. So most of the growth of the global middle class in this century is going to take place outside of Europe and outside of North America. Uh, and it is important for us to have manufacturing, not because these are good jobs. I mean, that's kind of the Trump thing, right? It's like blue-collar worker, you take your lunch pail, good, well-paid factory job. You know, that's not my view. My view is uh, there are going to be between half a billion and a billion uh, uh, people added to the population of Africa uh, in, the, in this century. Now, this is a good thing. Uh, if at the same time you have falling birth rates, increasing education, you're going to have this growing African middle class, right? There's a growing Indian middle class. You have billions and billions of people joining this gradually growing global middle class. And we want people in Northfield, Minnesota, you know, selling to those foreign markets, and what do they sell? They sell manufactured goods that you can put on a truck and ship and then put on a container ship and ship abroad. Or they sell high-end services in some cases. Uh, so, so I think you know, this whole protectionism versus free trade thing, <coughs> it, it's, what you actually want is something like what the Europeans have achieved, where you have a pooled market. It was, the EU was originally called the common market. Uh, I've always been in favor of a transatlantic free trade area where we, we pool our uh, 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 economy with, with that of the Europeans. Uh, and as long as we're not cheating against the French and the Germans are not putting a hand on the scale behind BMW, then, then that's great. You have this huge middle class. Uh, uh, that's kind of a long-winded way of beating up on David Ricardo who... Uh, who, he was wrong about comparative advantage. He was right about the landlords. He thought in the long run, the landlords would destroy capitalism. So if you're interested in Ricardo, check that out. <laughs> I think we'll end with that challenge to neoclassical <laughs> economics. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Good night.